realized that one of my one of my students did that. I had intended to anyway. I'd forgotten. And they're like, no, I already did it. Don't worry. <laughs> OK. But then then they had issues because they didn't share it with everybody. So that's right. Well, this will come into the this meeting channel after it's done and we're currently recording. So you're being uh, notified of the privacy policy up at the, the top. So you all probably see that. Um, all right, let's get started. Um, thank you, uh, Brian, for organizing this with Elisa. Um, my name is Julia Forsay. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the associate director. So I, the way this kind of goes is we, I'm going to give you a broad overview of just course design, and then we're going to get some hands-on like questions and uh, dig into whatever uh, specifics that are are pressing right now for for each of you, and then we'll follow up with um, individual consultations, or we can do. Uh, tell you about the things that are on our horizon. Um, I have I have my amazing team here. So Matt Claire is the other associate director for, of educational technology. Matt, you want to say hello? I'm sure everybody knows you. Hello, everyone. Good to see you again. And I have Alisa, who helped organize this session. Hi, everybody. Hi, Alisa. Hi. And Norbeck, who is uh, our newest CPI member, who's amazing. Uh, educate uh, maybe familiar to some of you um as he says hello dear cost professors you want to say hello norbeck yes please uh hello uh dear professors hello dr <laughs> ross dr amuki kyle everyone so i started joining uh tpa team march beginning of the march i work only one week at the office now i'm home <laughs> so please uh any help, uh, any questions here you can ask. That's great. That's great to have you on board and uh, so thankful for you to be able to transition to work from home so quickly. Um, so quickly, here's the agenda that we're going to be talking about is the online course, some technical stuff and then some sandbox for anybody uh, who wants to play around and try stuff. I usually run this about an hour and a half, but we've only booked an hour, so I will try not to belabor and go too long on the course design stuff. Um, I do want to point out that um, we are reachable uh, at EdTech at BrockCube at any time. So that that gets you access to the whole team. So please feel free to reach out if you have a specific question or you're stuck on anything. And this website, um, our flexible teaching and learning site, has most of the things that I'm going to be talking about or will be talking about, um, about accessing and how to do some of the, the, the major um, things that will be required to put your courses online. Um, so I just want to first start off with some very broad basics about the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. So obviously we all had to be here at the same time uh, so that we were here all in a video conferencing tool of some sort um, and we have to be here at three and we'll go till four. And so a lot of people are looking at synchronous options for their teaching and we want to we'll get a little bit into it, but we're asking that you try and consider asynchronous where possible because of technical and um, time zone and also just um, access to uh, spaces and uh, equipment where our students might be facing. So um, just being uh, considerate of what those different um, uh, issues are and, and deciding when is the most appropriate time for have a, a synchronous session versus asynchronous. And we've met um, uh, with Bao Ling talking about drop-in and what that would look like to have synchronous sessions, because that's a great example of, of your computer labs where you will need to have somebody to be available to actually answer and and um, and walk through some particular problems. But maybe some of the things can be put um, up ahead of time. And I know that, you know, talking to quite a few of you, you've um, you've done that already as I put main material available uh, beforehand. So the main thing is that our peak courses are typically 36 hours of contact hours. And so that is usually 12 weeks of three hours of, of lecture. And so we're really asking you to rethink what the contact hour looks like because a lot of this work, this contact will be pre uh, front loaded, pre-designed through the summer so that it's kind of set up beforehand. And then what you will be doing um, throughout the actual course will not be um, lecturing as much, but facilitating the learning and providing that instructor presence um, so that you're um, helping either through your um, 
lab demonstrators or if you have a, a lot of teaching assistants to, to ensure that there's a high quality contact to the material, but you don't necessarily need to be um, just presenting all the time. And so the first step in designing your course, this is a great opportunity for you to kind of take a step back and think, what are the big ideas in my course? And then chunking them into um, kind of like smaller big ideas. And so it doesn't necessarily need to be the have the entire breadth of what you've always taught. It really is a great opportunity for you to kind of simplify and go to basics. So when you design your course, think, what do the students who take this course need in order to be successful in the next course? Or if it's the final capstone course, what do they need to be successful when they leave and they graduate? And so then when you think about your lecture, we want you to kind of think about chunking it into sections so that you have some some context, some uh, textual information that's written. You could have a short video like a lecturette. Um, you could have access to readings um, or even uh, some videos um, that are available. There's some great documentaries. And then you would actually um, indicate what kinds of learning activities would happen. So instead of going to a, a class, people are sort of doing a class. Um, and so I know that when we went through the curriculum review with uh, you guys a couple years ago, you talked about all this stuff is applied. So this is your opportunity to kind of think about what do those applied things look in context to build towards whatever your final learning outcomes are. And we are recommending that you use Sakai Lessons because it does lay these things out in a really nice kind of structured way. Um, and there are some opportunities to use some OER, Open Educational Resources, and anything that you kind of have that was a document that you used to like um, scan um, if you want to get copyright clearance or if it's a chapter from a book, well, please contact uh, the library and they can put it into ARIES for you. They're, the library is a great partner in all of our copyright stuff. So this is an example of an online course. I'm actually teaching it right now, but I've created an open joinable site that anybody can see how I've laid out my lessons. Um, there's other examples too that we can get you access to, but just so you can see how you can have this uh, layout of graphics and sub pages. You can even put quizzes um, within the, the alignment of, of what sequence you want people to follow. Um, and if you want to be join, if you want to join that and you don't want to look how to do the joinable site, it is on the website, the Flexible Teaching Learning site, or just pop me an email, I can add you. Um, and the coolest thing about using lessons is that we now have this embed echo media uh, button, which is this cool blue button on the far right. Um, so this, instead of uploading gigantic video files um, that students have to then download, we now have kind of our own little private YouTube um, streaming server that can um, adjust based on bandwidth and device. Um, and they can, and it's, you can do it from any text editor. So you can do it in the assignments tool, you can do it in the forums, you can do it inside of um, the lessons. And so you can put your little video right in line with all of the other material on all on one page so people don't have to click anywhere to go look for things. Um, every uh, text editor also has this check accessibility. So if you're putting uh, graphics, it's, it will tell you some things like maybe you should put some headings and alt tags. And then there's also this cool little magic wand that uh, Elisa showed me. Um, so you can also put some alternate formats like maybe some audio files. And this is a great example of these different formats is um, is called the Universal Design for Learning. And so you're actually targeting these different strategic networks. Um, so the what of learning is mostly how we present our information. So this is this opportunity to have text in addition to video and audio and images. And then you're also allowing students to demonstrate their learning in multiple ways. And that's the how of learning so that they can also provide text or videos or um, drawings or however um, you want. Um, and the key part is the affective and sort of connecting it. And that's going back to the big ideas, like why is this a relevant, um, important thing for me to be learning as a learner? What is this connected to what I've learned before and how is it connected for what I'm gonna need in the future? So we just want you to, um, this is a whole workshop in its own, but um, just sort of to ground you in, there's a lot of um, learning research that says that having these multiple modes is really great for learning. So as the instructor, you're you're providing, you're not just delivering content, you're providing these opportunities to interact with students and you're providing opportunities for students to interact with each other. And the most important thing that you can do that we know is have instructor presence. 
So this contact hour notion is what's going to happen throughout the course is that you're you're going to set some very um, specific expectations of how often you can be communicated and that they don't need that we definitely don't want you to be available 24 7. We want you to set some like it's going to be within 24 hours during the weekdays. Um, I will be available online Thursday from 6 to 7. Um, so and then you just so that you are there to address the issues and if it's going to be primarily either your course coordinator or your lab demonstrators who are doing that, then that presence is important for you to um, ensure that they are also having that availability. So the key thing we want you to think about are these learning outcomes, which are those big ideas. And so those are the skills, the knowledge and values you want the students to have by the end of the course. And again, this is an opportunity for you to kind of pare back, simplify and rethink it so that you don't have to put um, everything in the kitchen sink into this course. It's really a good opportunity to kind of uh, bring it, uh, simplify it and think of what the main takeaways would be. So this is something that we talk about a lot in assessment is this constructive alignment. So often we say that we want our students to apply and analyze and evaluate and even create, but we, our assessments are designed really just to remember because we're designing multiple choice quest, uh, questions or, and it's really, those are the easiest kinds of questions to design is like what's, you know, fact-based things. So we're asking you to consider um, how your assessment matches to the learning outcome. So if you really do want to evaluate and create, let's try and design assignments that match that as opposed to just the standard testing. Um, this happens a lot when we're designing our assessments and we, we write our exams. Um, we have to consider the difference between learning, assessing for learning and assessing for performance. There are times when assessing performance are really important. Usually it's those culminating courses where you have to be like, am I ready to put this person out into the world? But along the way, there's mostly we're gonna be assessing for learning. So we're gonna ask you to rethink what that final exam looks like. It's not gonna be just your standard seated exam. Obviously, we're not gonna be able to do that. Um, and if it's gonna be an exam that you wanna put online, you have to think about open book. And there's these ways that we can design these exams so that they are cumulative, they're personalized and contextual so that they really um, have a lot of difficulty um, in their typical sense of cheating, that if they are actually communicating with other people, it's improving the learning and it's improving um, the actual outcomes of what you're trying to get at. I know that's a little bit of a hard sell, but uh, trust me, there, there's some really innovative stuff that's happening out there. And possibly um, there's some experiential opportunities because uh, there's a lot of need out there. Everybody is working remotely right now. So possibly there's ways that our students could connect to the community um, math and science, your experiential coordinator is Catherine uh, Brigatino, and she's awesome. Uh, she couldn't come today, but I definitely would pull her into anything if you're thinking about trying to connect to a community or organization and you want to have your final or one of your assignments be some kind of experiential opportunities. And it's worth noting that there are experiential education grants up to $3,000 if you want to try and design something like that. So please, um, we can give you a link to that if you want to consider one of those things. So this is something that we call authentic assessment. It's right. It's uh, instead of the uh, disposable assignment that you would just use over and over every year. This is something that is really meaningful, adding value into the world. Um, and this falls under the realm of open pedagogy. So this can happen many different ways. Um, so I just want to kind of plant seeds of rethinking of kind of the really fun, innovative things can happen. Obviously, some things are very fundamental and have to be done in quite traditional ways, but maybe in the upper year courses, you can start thinking about connecting to some real life scenarios. Um, and I just want to remind you that basically uh, Sakai handles, you know, simple assignments. Almost every file type can be uploaded into the assignment tool. So if that's the way that you want to take your submissions, then that's quite simple too. And it doesn't need to be some large uh, innovative project. You could just have your submissions be taken through the assignment tool. And I'm pretty sure, I guess I could do a hands up. Let's do hands up. How many people already use, um, how many people already use the assignment tool in Sakai? I do. Bowling. I bowling. Put raise your hand. <laughs> She's like, what? There's a new raise your hand button on the toolbar. This is my first time making people use it. Usually it's meant to be used if you want to talk. Um, but it Thank also you. can be it can all be also be used for voting. I think that raise your hand needs a upgrade to the app. 
Oh, you don't have it? No. It's weird. I didn't have it either, but now it's appeared. So maybe on a restart, it will be there. Okay, yeah. never mind. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to play around with that. Also, I want to see if you're make, you're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so this is our model for online courses. Basically, wherever possible, we're trying to recommend that you put things asynchronously. Um, limited enrollment does not mean necessarily uh, the entire course, but we, we'd like you to provide opportunities for small group interactions so that students can get that kind of support that they need, um, whether that's going to be in the drop-in labs or if it's going to be in seminars or smaller labs. Um, the key to asynchronous is setting explicit schedules. So it doesn't mean that it's going to be entirely self-paced. We know that online learning does require a lot of autonomy and self-direction, which is really challenging, especially for our first-year students. So you really need to kind of set some really clear deadlines of what it would be uh, required for success. And um, the other element is this quality assurance. So please, if you've done something before, check in, see what it was like, talk about it. You'll fix one thing and then try it again. Um, when we design this, um, if we're designing for fall, hopefully the work that we do will not necessarily have to just be for fall. It could be reused in many ways to flip so that you can um, provide these opportunities for rich interaction um, in small group learning. Okay, so some people can't raise their hand. Sorry about that. I should have asked that right from the beginning. Yeah, so some people are using the forums. So if you have a course, I think, uh, John, you probably, did you, you use the forums for your um, academic integrity course, 1P50? No. Uh, oh, yes, no? yes, I did, yeah. I think so, once upon a time. Anyway, it's yeah. great when you have like a controversial topic or something that can have multiple perspectives. It's good for those yeah. kinds of a discussion. And it does have a breakout where it understands um, it's group aware. So if you do have lab sections or seminar sections, it can be broke apart so that th those people can see only those sections. So it can give these opportunities. And um, the course, I know that they're doing the course collections due Friday. I would recommend where possible, even if we are not going to be on campus, definitely keep those labs and sections. Um, and it is a good opportunity to even rethink if you want to change the ideal size, if it's going to be fully online. It doesn't necessarily have to be 20 based on whatever the seminar size is it could be it could be what you think an ideal group interaction would be like um, there's implications for ta contracts which i still think should be the standard 20 students or whoever your your standard contract is i think it's different because you have labs so your labs and tutorials so they have you have different standards but it is an opportunity for, for you to kind of reimagine what that interaction could look like um, and I just want to say, uh, note that, um, again, that embed echo, this is my course I'm teaching right now. Um, I had the student, I had the students post a video as part of the, their forum discussion. So that it wasn't just entirely text based. It, it was a really fun way. I said, make a three minute video and show me, um, you know, the biggest findings for this. And I had some key questions. And so it was a really great kind of way to switch up you know, all of the reading that it's an opportunity to just watch a video. Um, and that's built right into forums now using that Echo 360, that embed feature. And so we're almost done. Uh, this is the key thing I'm going to keep saying over and over again. Right now we're in this red quadrant. Um, we're, we're in the high bandwidth, high immediacy quadrant where video conferences live. So we're in Teams right now. You, you might have already tuned out a couple times to my droning and and some people do have connectivity issues. Um, so I've been in a few sessions where people have had to phone in or, or drop in and out. So you have to be considerate of, of um, how, how intensive that can be. Um, so we're asking that sometimes if it's something that's just content delivery, you could come over into this yellow uh, quadrant and you could do some pre-recorded videos. Uh, the research says, you know, under 10 minutes is what a video should be. And I know that's hard to imagine what a three hour lecture could have just a 10 minute video. And so maybe you'll have a couple 10 minute videos, but think about those key things that students always are kind of confused about. And the rest of the stuff could be done as images or text or a reading or something. And then you're just putting a couple really key videos. Um, but then ultimately, down in this green cord quadrant, it could just be the the readings and the, and the text and images or using the discussion boards. 
Um, and something that we're just beginning to explore a lot more is this collaborative document creation. So there's opportunities for people to work on Word online, make PowerPoint online together. Um, I don't know if this group is is cringing with all these Microsoft products. I do sometimes myself, but um, some of them are not bad um, for the purpose. I just wanted to show you too. Um, so Teams does have a whiteboard feature, but it's not very good and it's inconsistent up across platforms and browsers. Um, the thing that I like is the uh, the blank slide. Uh, the blank slide is the best whiteboard, and then I'm giving you a tautology here to to, to make that true or not. Um, so it actually, I'm using the the loaded up PowerPoint, but if I had loaded up the web browser, that would have done a live drawing, and I can actually draw right with my stylus right now for you. So that might be a, a good way to kind of, if you did have to do tutorials online, is just using a blank slide in PowerPoint and draw it online. You can even share that PowerPoint and do things afterwards. And that um, is is the overview of the, the speedy version of course design. Um, I just want to point you back to this website and let you know that you're always welcome to contact EdTech. And then I kind of want to open it up for a conversation so that we can um, address. Uh, I see we have. Oh, Elisa has her hand up, but if um, if you wanted to ask a question or if you wanted to me to go back and cover anything, I got a whole team of experts here who can hopefully between all of us answer your questions. You want some questions? Yeah, please. What's this Echo 360? I've used Camtasia Studio. Matt, do you want to answer that one? Sure. Uh, Echo 360 is uh, our private video platform. Um, around other people, I may just call it a private cloud, but no, it's a platform. Um, and it is integrated in Sakai. And it's uh, more importantly integrated into the text that is Julie's demonstrating there. So you can uh, create video through uh, any tool that you are currently comfortable with that has an output of um, MPEG, WMV, the standard video formats, Camtasia being one of them. And you can also use the Universal Capture tool, which will let you download and install uh, right from Sakai. Uh, it does require admin privileges, but otherwise it's pretty simple to install. And can record your screen, can record your webcam if you have one, of course your microphone, and make a video. It's uh, a very simplified interface. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, at the trade-off of features, um, but uh, there's ways to get into it but the short, that are a little more advanced. But the short answer is anywhere in Sakai that you can uh, get to that text editor, you as the instructor or your students, you can add video as content, limited just to enroll in that course, and it's accessible on the other side of the Great Firewall of China, which is an interesting uh, thing to consider with uh, over a thousand Brock students that might still be in China right now. That, that's okay. a quick overview. Give me some more questions so I can get into specifics. Um, one of my problems has always been to when creating as an instructor, I'd like to see what the student sees. Now, I, I know Sakai was a little bit better with that eventually, but um, can I log in like like Teams? Can I log in at, with two different user codes, which I presume I can do, and see how Teams works? Can I do that with the video? Um, if, if you have that second user code, I happen to have a staff and student account, and I don't recommend the experience, um, but it, it, it's possible. Um, but Sakai does have that view as a student, which uh, none of the people with the min privileges, like Julia and myself, can access, but instructors can. Where at the top <laughs> right, you can grab a handlebar to kind of switch around to student view, and it will represent that as students would see it. Yeah, it's usually up here. If you can see where I'm pointing. Yeah, I, I know the viewer student. I use it all the time. Well, um, also, you can add the use. If you have a student account, you can add the student account to Sakai, your, your Sakai's course site, and log in to Sakai with your student ID and to preview the video. That would be yep. the easiest way. 
I don't have a student account, and officially I'm terminated by well, Brock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, um, I, I have a student account myself. It's it's not a, a nice life of uh, two accounts. Uh, do you have, have you used uh, Sakai Persons or Persona? Sorry, Google Chrome Persons or Personas, which has been actually helpful being within that space. But uh, on the video, uh, embed anywhere. Uh, the view as will give you a preview. Um, if you flag it for uh, CPI, we will uh, commission high quality captions within four days. And we are working on trying to get um, machine generated captions on all videos as a baseline. So no notice to CPI and we'll get some machine generated captions on there for you. Uh, if you flag for us that this is a video that needs captioning, um, we will make sure it gets a caption. Um, just send edtech at Brock U. If it's for an assessment, if it's for other reasons, if you think there's a reason, let us know. We'll make a caption for it. Great, thanks. Robson, you also had a question, or was it exactly the same? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, my question is what was related to uh, Echo 360 Media. That uh, the point that I usually I. I use extensively lessons in Sakai to post slides or lecture notes, right? Yep. But so far, uh, I think I just tried first time when using like a lessons. Uh, then I just use this as a tool to upload all and organize all the slides I have in my course so that students would be seeing these as kind of a set of folders and subfolders where they can access. In case I want to use Echo uh, too for uploading and doing some streaming of short videos, right? How should I proceed? Should I create like pages and embed it in the page I create in the lesson section uh, uh, the video I want, or I could create a link where it would be redirecting to this uh, uh, quote uh, cloud that is available for View students to uh, access the streaming. Does anybody want to answer that? Uh, uh, just from hearing it, uh, without seeing your lesson, but seeing Julia's, uh, it should be straightforward to have the existing folder structure you've made, and then you could add a, uh, a new text uh, box on top of the folder if it's. Uh, don't know if uh, in lessons if you're making pages with content or something um, different from that, but um, using the basic tools that Julia is showing here, um, adding video should be that uh, to add text in the text box there. Um, you pro I know you have examples in here too as well, Julia. Uh, right, thank you. Uh, a spot where you've got a to-do list at the top, you've got uh, that folder content there, and, and you've added a uh, uh, block, I think it's called blocks, I'm not sure, of uh, text where you um, press that blue circle to add Echo 360, re upload and record your video, and you even got the mild commentary, this could be my welcome video underneath it. Does that sound like a model that would fit in your course? Uh, yeah, uh, because in my case, I would be up, uh, continually like uh, uploading like uh, lecture notes, slides mm -hmm. for the students to follow up. And then I have already like for this course and the remaining of the previous course uploaded like short videos. But what I did, I recorded everything offline and uploaded as just a file, right? Right. But it would be interesting to do this streaming service at least for them to watch on the browser. I don't know. Would the students be able to download the content too, or is just kind of they need to have internet access to access uh, to to watch these streams? Mm. Uh, they would need to have internet access. Um, this is the first time I've addressed the download question in a how could I make it so it's possible uh, frame. Usually it's a how can I stop that entirely. But I think <laughs> computer science instructors appreciate that there's probably no stopping it if the web browser has access to it. Um, uh, if you want to download it, I think there are some ways that you can use echo360.ca, which is kind of powering all this in the back end. 
um, so the college is identifying the students and the instructors and kind of transparently embedding echo360.ca in the background. In this space, uh, we have the capacity for students to download it, but I think it's off in most instances. Plus, there's a totally unconfigured uh, functionality for podcasts, which we haven't explored. Um, but if you'd like to engage the CPI and kind of experiment, we're interested. Okay. Yeah, like uh, because what I have done, I have like a uh, made record uh, recordings available to my uh, real time lectures already, and what it does, like a uh, my Microsoft Share Zone or something, create like an entry where it makes makes the the the, the whole recording available, but everything's on the browser, right? Yeah, um, if that was Microsoft Stream, I think it uh, tries to block downloads. Um, but we have so many options. Even a, a, a Class One Drive folder or a Teams site would actually allow students to just uh, hold those files uh, locally and review them. Um, okay. So there's a, there's a lot of options for video these days. I will note that if they are loose video files, we can't provide a caption to them. We could provide a transcript, but we couldn't provide a caption time to text caption to it. But um, there's a lot of ways to do this uh, in our um, fast for, uh, options for technology. And uh, the CPI is trying our best to give simple answers when there's so much to choose from. OK, yep. Thanks. But happy to experiment more with that specifically if you want to follow up. OK. Yeah, I'll try to play with the, the Echo 360. I'll, I'll I'll see I'll maybe use this week because I'll be uploading videos weekly. So I'll try using it like in making these short videos available through it to see how it goes. At least I have a backup. My my videos are all in my machine. So if things backfire, I can replace it <laughs> right away. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you're thinking of that. Uh, like the student need that some people do need that. So that's great. Um, Brian, you have your hands up. Yes, I do. Thanks. Um, back to the issue of cheating on exams. Um, you know, we had to finish up our term in online this uh, last month, and uh, we had 35 case, about 35 cases of cheating on the final. Uh, students sending each other answers, uh, copying from the internet. The courses in Java, and we had some students copy and paste C++ code for answers. Um, <clears throat> yes, and so other than not have tests and finals at all, which in some courses is very difficult if they're more theoretical in nature, um, how can we attempt to even handle that? And I'm not talking about assignment cheating, which will always be around in our discipline, unfortunately. But um, so any ideas would be greatly appreciated. I'm waiting for all my great colleagues to come forward. It's a, it's a real challenge. Yeah. Does Brock have any license with any invigilating software? Uh, invigilating, uh, we do not. Uh, of course, uh, I don't need to say anything more than there is turn in and we're all caught up. Um, the province is made a, um, a proctoring tool available to the uh, universities and colleges, and the individual universities and colleges are evaluating that tool and making their own decisions about deployment. Brock is evaluating. Um, we are linked up with six other universities to do a privacy review. The tool itself is called ProctorTrack. Um, I have no insight, but it feels a lot like the, uh, the lowest bidder won the contract. Um, That's what I thought. Uh, um, it's highly uh, biased towards um, uh, AI-based proctoring. And um, we do have a, a pilot going uh, as of tomorrow with an accounting program. Uh, and that particular course is a good pilot because the masters of accounting students um, applied, got their uh, offer letters uh, requiring them to have a Windows-based PC that can support proctoring. Um, um, with you know COVID nineteen foresight two, three years ago, um, so they're going to be the first pilot. Um, but uh, we are not expecting uh, that 
particular tool to be a game changer. ESL is also interested, but quickly lost interest when they learned that they could have their exam script copied and then six hours later getting a, get a report that told them it happened. Um, so Brock may uh, ultimately deploy that tool, but it will likely be, if it is deployed, it will be with some uh, stringent restrictions on its use, which may include external uh, uh, regulations for exams being part of it. Uh, one limitation there, the second limitation is, as ESL said, uh, if, if they're just going to report six hours later that the, uh, an incident's happened, it doesn't do much for preventing incidents. So there's something coming, um, but that's certainly not the total solution. It's huge. I don't know. I feel like it's a huge privacy implication, too. And also, uh, I don't know if you've been reading the news, but there's been a lot of pushback from other institutions because uh, Laurier forced their students to buy cameras. And so that better cameras, was pushback. not just cameras, better cameras, better yeah. cameras. Right. Wow. Uh, York had a petition because they, uh, you know, so there's been a lot of uh, student pushback on it. And I feel like it's problematic. But I want I would like to we could talk individually like about what your course outcomes are and maybe some assessments that could be designed. It's definitely not a one. I have a great answer that will fit all of you for sure. 